Welcome to JupyterCon 2020. This is my talk on distributed computing using Jupyter Notebooks with Spark. This is part of the data science application series. And jumping right into introductions, uh, my name is Jason Yang. Uh, I am a data scientist at InMarket. At InMarket, we focus on consumer intelligence and real-time activation using mobile advertising. Um, so uh, this presentation is available on github.com slash Jason with coffee slash jupiter.com 2020 dash jupiter dash spark. So anything that you see, including this presentation and some of the Jupyter notebooks and also the uh, CSV file is going to be available up there. Um, if you're having trouble finding um, the presentation or would like to connect with me or just have general questions, you can find me on linkedin.com, uh, Jason with coffee. Now, for an overview of this talk, I'm going to start beginning with a background of how this talk came to be, how I came up with the idea, um, and then the reason why we're interested in using Jupyter Notebooks with Spark. There's two main reasons uh, that I can think of. Is uh, Number one is you want to scale out, and number two is uh, 2020, this is a pretty good year to use Jupyter and Spark together. Uh, following the why, we're going to go into the hows. So the first part of the how, it's, uh, I'm going to show you how to spin up a Spark cluster with Jupyter Notebook on Google Cloud. Uh, next, we're going to go into a little bit of a demonstration of me using a 16-node cluster uh, that has more than one terabyte of RAM for a machine learning uh, algorithm called uh, LDA topic modeling. Uh, lastly, once we get the output of that modeling, we're going to visualize the results in Jupyter Notebooks, because why not, right? We're using Jupyter Notebooks here. Now, just for a little bit of background, um, as we all know that the amount of data available is growing exponentially. So I couldn't find a really good graph demonstrating that. Um, there, there's not one source of showing how much data has grown over time. Um, one thing that I found is this is uh, the number of internet users. So definitely the number of def internet users have grown much more over the last few decades. And uh, with that comes with more data. Uh, I think just thinking about uh, your own experiences, like how much data were you analyzing five years ago, 10 years ago? I would argue that today it's much more than that. And um, I found out that Jupyter and Spark is a very powerful combination that all data scientists should kind of understand and you know dabble in if possible when they have time for it. And uh, lastly, uh, recent developments in the cloud offerings, especially in AWS, GCP, and Azure, makes the management of these Jupyter, Spark, and big data environments very, very simple. So going to the why, um, usually if you're dealing with big data, you want to try to scale out instead of scaling up. And also, um, 2020 is just a very good year to get into it. Now, more a little bit more on scaling out. Um, so this came from my own personal experience and experience of my friends and colleagues here, in that um, when you first start doing data science work, uh, you usually do it on your own local computers. So imagine just doing you know, Jupyter Notebooks on your computer. You're limited to how much CPU you have on your local machine and how much RAM. So if you're analyzing a data set that is like, I don't know, a couple gigabytes to maybe like terabytes big, um, you start hitting the limitations on your local computer very, very fast. Now, one way to address that is to uh, host Jupyter on a cloud. And most of the time, this is a single instance, right? So you can just pick a very, you can configure your cloud instance to be very powerful, 32 CPU, 256 gigs of RAM. You can even go more powerful than that. Um, but at some point, scaling the computational resources on that one machine is going to hit a limit. And instead of just trying to build a, I don't know, 100 CPU core and 5 terabyte RAM machine, which you could definitely do, is often better uh, and a little bit more resilient if you scale it out. Instead of having one machine, you want to have like 10 machine on the analytics on that. The data is much more resilient. And uh, I think the cost is much uh, cheaper as well, just because um, you can have nodes that are uh, cheaper to uh, you know, borrow and rent on the cloud just because they're smaller um, for that. Now, uh, in my opinion, 2020 is a very good year to get started with Jupyter and Spark. Part of it is Apache Spark uh, 3.0 is released. And um, with 3.0, um, it really, uh, if you look at the release, um, there's not so much that directly impacts Jupyter and Spark integration, but 
a lot of it is that you see the, uh, the pattern in that um, there's a very big shift in using data frames instead of RDDs. RDDs are um, data frames are built on top of RDDs. And uh, coding in RDDs can be difficult at times, but data frame is a very good framework. Um, that most data scientists know how to use. So um, a lot of the code that smart code that you see today in this presentation, you'll understand just because you've worked with Pandas data frames before. And furthermore, um, since 2018, cloud providers have created images for Jupyter, Zeppelin, and Spark um, for you to just spin up and, and manage very easily. And since 2018, the technology and the maintenance of that has gotten much better and much more stable. So this is a pretty good year uh, after the, you know, the trial and errors of since 2018, to kind of just take advantage of that. Now, following the why this is something that we want to explore, let's just uh, show you how. So remember, the first part is I'm going to show you how to spin up a Spark cluster with Jupyter Notebook on Google Cloud. Uh, I chose Google Cloud just because um, I work at I, I enjoy using Google Cloud, but you can do this. Uh, there's similar steps in AWS and also Microsoft Azure. Um, once we submit up this Klaus cluster, uh, we're going to uh, create a 16 node cluster with uh, one terabyte of RAM and just do uh, some interesting analysis uh, for LDA topic modeling on uh, coronavirus news articles. Um, uh, and lastly, once uh, the SWAR cluster finishes its uh, analysis, we're going to visualize the results in Jupyter Notebooks. Now for the how. Uh, for Jupyter Notebook and Spark on GCP, uh, you want to be using a service called Dataproc. Dataproc is a Google Cloud service for running Apache Spark and Hadoop clusters. So uh, on a if you're using AWS, it's called EMR. You want to look into EMR. So each of these cloud providers have their own similar technology that does it, and they have managed services to spin up Jupyter and Spark pretty seamlessly and you know very streamlined and simple to use. So in this scenario, we're going to use GCP here. So uh, once you're in the con Cloud Console, you're going to see, uh, click on data product, and you're going to see uh, a bunch of options. You want to click on Create Cluster. And once you hit Create Cluster, you're going to be taken to this image here, and it's going to ask you to configure your machine type. Now, for this, we're going to pick a master node of just, you know, for, you know, for CPU or 50 and 15 gigs of memory RAM. Um, you know, just this is just a demo, and um, you can scale out depending on what your needs are. If you're using, uh, if you don't need that much power, you can definitely scale down. And if you need more, you can scale out, um, get much more powerful machines with much more storage, and uh, and in increase the number of machines just to get that computational power you need to do your analysis. Uh, once you do that, this is where it gets uh, very fun here, in my opinion. Uh, you're going to just enable uh, just just the basic administration stuff. Enable uh, component gateway access to other uh, to, to the web interfaces because that's how we're going to get to uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, we're going to provide a cloud storage bucket. Uh, this is just a uh, online file storage system that you can save all your notebooks to and all, all the files. Uh, one important thing here is to set image to 1.5 plus. Uh, this is just the latest image um, in. 2020. I know that the default image is 1.3, and that uses uh, Python 2 uh, by default. But if you use image 1.5 and you know and later, uh, Python 3 is the latest. Uh, it's the default. And uh, two very important things here is you want to select com uh, optional components and allow API access uh, to other cloud services, uh, just so that you can use other cloud services in your uh, in, in Google Cloud. Um, and the most important part here is the select optional components. And once you click into that, you're going to see that uh, everything here is very simplified. Uh, it shows you what option, what components are available. AWS EMR has a very similar UI here in that uh, you can just select Anaconda and Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you can select, uh, the, and as you can see from the list, there's also Hive, Zeppelin, Druid, Presto, and Zookeeper. So uh, this is a very good way to just like um, learn about new technologies, in my opinion. In this case, we're going to just use uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Anaconda for our uh, work here. So once you do all that and you hit Create Cluster, and it probably spends like uh, about a minute to five minutes just to get all, depending on what your cluster, how big they are. Once it's all ready, you want to click on Web Interfaces, and you'll see a link for Jupyter. Right. So uh, I know from personal experience, if you click on Zeppelin, you'll see a link for Zeppelin as well. So like 
this is just like everything is done through a GUI interface and you just click and choose what you need and how you want the service to be spun up and used. And once you click all that, you know, all we just talked about, you click on Jupyter and you'll be just taken to a Jupyter notebook environment connected to all the computational power that you spun up and specified previously. Now, once you do that, you know, you'll be there. And um, the next part of this demo, I'm going to show you that uh, what it looks like when we, when we spin up a 16 node cluster. Now, um, in doing this talk, I was looking for a very big data set that you can't do on your computer. So one thing that I found is uh, the COVID-19 news article data set that Google uh, hosts on BigQuery. So if we look at this, um, this is basically a data table uh, comprised of a bunch of news articles based on COVID-19 news, relating to COVID-19 news. Uh, and you can see that the size of this table is uh, 25 gigs big. So this is not going to fit on your 16 gig CPU, 16 gig RAM local computer. You can definitely spin up a beefy instance to do it. But um, at some point, you're going to run into a limit, right? Because uh, 16 gigs is just like a storage. But uh, analysis often takes much more RAM for that and much more computational CPU for that. So you definitely want to scale up a big cluster for it. Uh, and as an example of what uh, what uh, the columns are displaying, uh, uh, this table has a column called date time, just when was it recorded, a URL of what where the news article was uh, posted, a title of the news article, and the context, which is uh, like a very short expert, excerpt of what the article is talking about. So what we want to do is to take uh, 37 million of these uh, rows of, of these records and do top of modeling on them uh, on the title and context. And uh, this is very computationally expensive um, if you do it on your local machine. And uh, if you scale out on a smart cluster, it's actually not that bad. So uh, once you spin up your cluster, this is the code that we want to use for LADA topic modeling. Uh, this is just very basic. This is very minimal. Uh, so the first part is data prep. Uh, you want to tokenize your content, uh, the, the words. Uh, and then you want to remove the stop words, right? So in this case, we want to remove any blanks, any coronavirus, pandemic, and just some of these uh, normal words like said and also that just shows up a lot in our, um, in our text here. So uh, remember that this is COVID-19 news. So coronavirus is probably going to be mentioned in every single news story. And we just want to be modeling topics on that has coronavirus in them. And then after you tokenize and remove stop words, you want to vectorize it. Right? So in this case, uh, I chose a vocab size of 5,000. Um, I played around between 1,000 to 10,000 and like 20,000. 5,000 is like a pretty good optimum uh, for me in this case. And uh, the number of topic, I chose 10, um, just as a starter, because this is a demo. And I chose a max duration of 30. I can definitely go more or less, uh, depending uh, what we want to do here. But in this demo, I chose these uh, configurations. Now, once you uh, submit this job, uh, you'll see that this is the resource monitoring graph uh, on the cluster. So uh, overall, this took about an hour to process. And it fully took advantage of the one terabyte memory that I allocated to my cluster. In fact, it actually uh, maxed out uh, for like a period of 30 minutes when it just doing intensive computation of the LDA stuff. So the first peak here that you see, that was coming from my vectorizer. And this, this long bridge here, this is the 30 iterations here. Um, and you can see that the CPU graph actually uh, goes up to about 30% usage at some point near the end as well. So this took about an hour to run. I had 16 node cluster. And this is actually very amazing because imagine like I have a 16, I spun up 16 very powerful machines uh, totaling about uh, one terabyte of RAM and I think a couple, uh, like dozens of CPUs as well. So overall, running this in the cloud for one hour, it cost me about $9, which is uh, ridiculous because I build my own computers. And if I build a machine with one terabyte of RAM, uh, 
that's that's not going to be nine dollars. Um, and I don't need that type of computational power every single minute. Of usage, right? So this is very powerful in that I can spin up a cluster, do my analysis for an hour, uh, rent out the machine that that I can that requires me to do the analysis, and then just pay for that. And uh, so, like, this is a network graph, and you know that that's what I find very amazing in that, like, uh, it wasn't that hard to set up, and uh, running it is actually very cheap as well. So uh, once we finished running it, um, these are the topics that came out of the model. So um, just going briefly over them, uh, we have 10 topics. Uh, the first topic uh, is relating about school and students. The second topic is talking about markets. So, so remember, this is like all the news article that is relating to coronavirus. So people talk about coronavirus and school reopening. People talk about how the coronavirus is impacting markets. And then obviously, there are topics that's related about deaths and confirmed cases. Uh, there's another topic that's kind of centered around uh, positive rates and testing. And then uh, the, uh, the fifth topic is talking about uh, health and state and, you know, just I think about public services in general. And then the fifth topic is specifically talking about um, patients, hospitals, and medical care. And then uh, there is actually a specific topic talking about vaccines and virus threat and health and, you know, maybe just research in that aspect. And then there is actually one specific, talking, specific topic talking about China and the lockdown. And the last two topics talks about uh, health, um, help, support, food. And the last one talks about the United States and our President Trump. So overall, like um, when we analyze all the, artic uh, all the corona news articles, we can divide them up into 10 topics. And that's pretty much the output, the model output from the Spark analysis. The next step is, you know, we, we could definitely just use that as is and, um, you know, visualize it using Spark, Spark, you know, tools. But since we are running it using Jupyter Notebooks and we actually submitted a job in, in a Jupyter Notebook and all of this is in a notebook environment, what we can do is we can visualize the results using the benefits of everything in Jupyter. So that includes your Pandas library, that includes your Seaborn library, your Mat Matplotlibs, and uh, you can even do further analysis using scikit-learn and other packages just to you know, take whatever uh, the output is from your Spark analysis and then pipe it into a scikit-learn you know, library, a package, and do further analysis on it. So that's a really good part. And doing that translation is super, super easy. Uh, so you can see that um, I created a, an, an aggregation of just um, summarizing topics and domains and counting how many times an article is uh, pertaining to a topic per domain, right? So uh, once I have that, uh, I can write dot to pandas and create a pandas data frame, in this case, PDF, uh, simply. And uh, I also created a uh, CSV file, which is available for you guys if you guys want to look into what the data looks like. So like um, in this instance, like it's super easy to take a Spark data frame and translate them into a Pandas data frame. And once we're in a Pandas data frame, we can do everything that we can in a Pandas data frame, right? So one cool thing is to just, why don't we look at how many COVID-19 news articles uh, we have for each domain? So, uh, you know, just we can take advantage of the plot function. And here I have a horizontal bar graph. And uh, we can see that, so you can see visually that uh, our, our biggest contributor is uh, Riders and then MSN and then uh, Yahoo and then iHeart. And then you'll also see uh, that this is not just US only. We have a few uh, news sources from other places like all, allafrica.com. Uh, the Hindu.com and uh, XinhuaNet.com, right? So this is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty global data set in terms of COVID-19 news. Uh, so this is looking at it as from a domain perspective. We can look at it from a topic perspective, right? What is the distribution of COVID-19 news articles by topic? And we can see from this graph um, in that most news articles around the world is talking about COVID-19 and, and its impact in the market, and also COVID-19 and China, right? 
and China's lockdown and people and travel. So like these are the two biggest topic and the, the, the lowest one is actually uh, COVID-19 and the United States. Now this is news around the world. So it's not just about the US, right? So um, that's like a very high level perspective of what the what our data is about and um, on a topic level perspective. And the benefit of doing this in Jupyter Notebook is that we also get the benefit of other packages, right? Like scikit-learn. So what I did here is um, I just did a standard scalar and looked at what each news article. So, so like this is not directly outputted from Spark. This is further analysis that I did on Jupyter. So what I did is um, I just look at the distribution of a news channel on a certain topic, right? So before we can see that like around the world, most people are talking about uh, the market and also China and not much about uh, United States, right? So that is like the basic distribution of like all news uh, stations, the uh, news domains, right? And here we can look at each domain and see how they compare to that average, right? So um, just like a very good example is of, if we look at xinhuanet.com, um, most of their news article is centered around cases um, com and, and confirmed cases. So most of their news articles, news stories in you know, Xinhuanet is going to be centered around new confirmed cases. And they don't talk about uh, coronavirus and school a lot. So xinhuanet.com is um, a news domain it's a Chinese news domain. So it's very interesting to see that they spend most of the news that they have around coronavirus is centered around new and confirmed cases. And they don't spend a lot of their airtime talking about schools and, and, and reopening and 2020 in general, right? So that is one interesting aspect that we can gain from information that we can gain from the analysis from LDA topic modeling and visualizing it in Jupyter Notebook. Now, the other interesting thing that I see from this graph is um, uh, I included CNN and Fox News. Okay, so uh, I thought it was it was very interesting to look at the uh, the amount of airtime that they talk about uh, Trump and United States. So uh, it turns out that CNN outputs more news relating uh, the U.S. president and coronavirus much more uh, not much more but more than uh, Fox News. So um, that is like a very interesting insight in that um, it's, not, it's not the same. And in fact, uh, you know, one news station talks about coronavirus in relation to the US president much more than another news station. And lastly, one interesting insight, you know, like basically there's a lot of different insights and now it shows uh, these six specific news domains. Um, if you want to, you can take the code and look at uh, other news domains. Um, and see what they look like. The last one that I'm just going to point out for interesting sake is uh, NZ Herald, which is from New Zealand. Uh, I think their most talked about topic in relation to coronavirus is centered around help support food and people. So it's like, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, most, you know, like New Zealand is pretty nice. And from a news standpoint in coronavirus coverage and that, you know, they talk about support and help. Much more, the, much more than the other news domains here. And this is just, you know, looking at the NZ Herald. Maybe some other news domains in New Zealand will have different point of view. And also um, other news domains in these countries will have different points of view. So um, I encourage you to look at the notebook that I hosted on GitHub and take a deeper dive at it if you're interested in data. Now, to wrap up this talk, um, we talked about how Jupyter and Spark is a powerful combination in your data science toolkit. So in this, in this talk, we showed you how to spin up a Spark cluster uh, with Jupyter Notebooks on Google Cloud. And you can do this, you know, you don't just have to do this on Google Cloud, you can do it on EMR, on AWS and uh, uh, Microsoft Azure. And once we spin up that Jupyter Notebook backed by a cluster of machines, we can run PySpark on it. Uh, in this case, we did LDA topic modeling. But you're not just, you know, you're limited to whatever Spark can do on a massive scale. So you can do regression. I think they also have recommendation engines on there. And um, furthermore, like if you're just kind of exploring the data and you need this higher computation, you can visualize the results um, in other packages like Matplotlib, 
uh, and pandas and, or, or do further analysis on, you know, using scikit-learn. So like, this is a very powerful combination, in my opinion, in that you can get computational power of Spark and then the, you know, the ease of use of Jupyter in one system. And that just makes work very, very efficient, in my opinion. Now, just coming back to this, um, like the presentation is available on GitHub. Uh, uh, it's under my uh, user at Jason with Coffee slash JupyterCon 2020 dash Jupyter dash Spark. Uh, if you have trouble finding the information, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, at Jason with Coffee. And um, you know, I hope you enjoy this presentation. And uh, I'll see you around. Um, I'm hopefully in the chat right now. Um, feel free to reach out and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, thank you for joining my talk on Jupyter and Spark.